Well, with this lesson, we're going to complete our short study on Paul's letter to the Colossians. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to pause the video right now and get it. If you need to catch up with us, you can find the previous lessons on this same YouTube channel. But obviously, you'll need your Bibles. I encourage you to read along when this minister or any other minister uh, references the Word of God. You need to check out everything that he says by the Word. Last week in chapter 3, we saw several different aspects of living the new life in Christ. We saw that there are some sins so dangerous, so deadly, that we must mortify them. We found that word means put them to death. And these are the same kinds of sins that the New Testament tells us to flee from. And then there are some sins so defiling that we take them off like a filthy garment is taken off. And once those filthy garments of sin are removed, we're told there are certain things we must put on. The garments of righteousness, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, love, peace, and even we saw a song. And last but not least, last week we saw how the new life in Christ influences human relationships. Important human relationships, that of husband and wife, parent and child, and employee and employer. So I was reading chapter 4 in preparation for this lesson. I realized just how many people Paul mentions in this chapter. I didn't take time to count them. Perhaps you can do that. But so many people are mentioned by name. So many people that were so very important to him in the work of the ministry. In light of that, I've given this chapter a title to help us remember what it's all about. The Blessing of Good Friends in the Work of the Lord. I hope that God has blessed you with some good friends that encourage you and help you in what you're doing for the Lord. Paul was a great man of God, but there were so many others who were a great help to him in doing God's work. Uh, may we be one of those helpers, and may we be one of those who assists, and may we be one of those who's blessed with others to assist us. So thank God for those dear friends who've helped us in the work of the Lord. But before he gets to the subject of these important friends, though, he speaks on the subject of prayer. The subject of prayer. How should we be praying? Verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. To continue in prayer, that means to pray without ceasing, as we're commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Don't, don't quit praying. Jesus even gave us a parable in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, about a persistent widow who gives us an example of what it is to pray without ceasing. It says in Luke 18, 1, that Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end, or for this reason, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Unlike the unjust judge, the Lord will avenge us speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And this is talking about continuing, being persistent in prayer. We not only continue in prayer, we're to be watchful in prayer. This means that we're spiritually awake, that we're vigilant. The idea of a, a watchman on a wall. Uh, we're to be watchful regarding the Lord's return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, Watch therefore, be spiritually vigilant, in other words, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We also see the word used when Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. Uh, Matthew 26, 36 gives us these words, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Set ye here while I go and pray yonder. 
And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith the end of them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. There it is. Be spiritually vigilant, awake. And watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not stay awake and pray and be vigilant? In other words, watch, be vigilant and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Knowing that we're living in the time before his return in the last days, we should be watchful in prayer. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore, in other words, in light of this, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Because we see it's, it's so very true that if we're not watchful, we could be ill prepared to meet him when he returns. Revelation 3 speaks of one of the seven churches and Jesus says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, in other words, be spiritually awake and alert and vigilant. I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. And even Romans 13, 11 speaks of this same kind of prayerful watchfulness. It says, knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So we continue in prayer with watchfulness and then also with thanksgiving. Uh, we can give God thanks for those things that we know are ours in Christ, those things for which we've prayed, even though we do not yet hold them in our hands. We read about being thankful in prayer even in the previous chapter. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So continuing with this brief teaching on prayer, Paul expresses some personal prayer requests. He was never too proud to ask others to pray for him, and sometimes we're reluctant to ask others to pray. I know sometimes we struggle with asking others to pray. We're often so willing to pray for them, but when asking them to pray for ourselves, somehow we, we don't always do it. Paul gave some specific personal prayer requests. He said, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us. So when you're in that mode of praying and watching and giving thanks, don't forget to pray for us. First, he said, pray that God would open unto us a door of utter utterance. In other words, God would give us opportunities for ministry. Remember, Colossians is one of the prison epistles. He's incarcerated in Rome, but he's praying that wherever he is, God will open up doors of ministry. I pray that for you today. God would open up opportunities for you to share the gospel. So that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. You know, I'm incarcerated because I've, I've preached this mystery. I've walked through those open doors before and I've preached this mystery of Christ. And, and you and I know from having seen this word before in these studies that mystery in the New Testament is not an unknown. It's something that was unknown or hidden, but has now been revealed. He said uh, that I may make it manifest. In other words, that I may preach it clearly. And, and that's my prayer. For even myself as a, a pastor teacher. I pray that the Lord would help me to make the things of the word of God, the things of Christ, clear, manifest. And he says, as I ought to speak, he says, I want to say the things that I should say in a clear manner. I don't want to leave any confusion. And I would appreciate a prayer like that for myself. So he requests prayer for effective ministry in his own life. And then he gives us some keys for effective ministry in our own communities. 
keys to effective witness in our communities. He says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That's a term for the unsaved. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So in witnessing to those who are without, we first must cry out to God for wisdom. That God would give us specific wisdom in knowing how to reach each person that he places in our path. We can't rely on human ingenuity and human methodology for this. We're going to need the wisdom that comes from heaven. If our witness to those that are without is to be effective, we must redeem the time, biblical phrase, but it, it means to make the most of every opportunity. As God gives open doors, you know, Paul prayed for doors of utterance in his life, and he's telling us there will be those times of opportunity, and we need to take advantage of them. Divine wisdom will help us to see those opportunities, and I pray that divine power and boldness would help us to walk through those open doors. If our witness to those that are without is to be effective, we must be gracious in our speech. That word means that our speech should be courteous and kind and pleasant. If our speech is not courteous, kind, and pleasant, it's the opposite. We're surely not going to be very effective in influencing anyone for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if our witness to those that are without is to be effective, we must be like salt. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Uh, we must cause others to hunger and thirst for what we have. You know, sometimes I've heard people say of a, of a professed believer, if that's Christianity, I, I don't want anything to do with it. May that never be said of us, rightly so. Instead, let it be so that the, the saltiness, the spirituality, the, the touch of Christ in our lives would, would cause others to hunger and thirst for what we have. And then he says to be effective in ministry in our communities, we must be always ready to give an answer. How to speak to each one. That's part of divine wisdom. Be led by the Holy Spirit. We see this also in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. The Greek word is apologia. That's, we get our word apologetics, the defense of the gospel from that word. So be ready to give an answer, to, to speak up for Christ to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, this is a verse that I believe the Lord gave me early on in this pandemic, uh, that others are to see our lives and the peace and the grace with which we walk and live in this world and realize there's something different going on in us. Okay, now we're, we're beginning the section coming up where Paul begins to list all of those good friends who've been such a blessing to him in the work of the Lord. Some of these names may seem very familiar to you. Some of them may be new names. But all of them played a part. They played a role in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. First is Tychicus. Good friends in the work of the minister, Tychicus. He was a beloved spiritual brother of the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 7, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you. So this Tychicus came from Paul there in Rome, and he reported to the Colossians what was going on with Paul. He says he's a beloved brother, and he's a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. A faithful minister. Whatever we do for the Lord, it, we want it to be said of us in the end that we were faithful. 1 Corinthians 4 2 says it's required of stewards that a man be found faithful. We all long for the day when we'll hear the words from our Lord Well done, thou good and faithful. But the word faithful means loyal and steadfast and constant. So this Tychicus was a, a beloved brother and he was loyal and steadfast and constant. He was a servant of the Lord, a minister. That's what that word means if you remember from previous lessons. It's a minister, a servant rather. And then here's a good friends in the work of the Lord. Here's Onesimus in verse 9. 
with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. He was from their community. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So here's another one. Onesimus was a slave, the slave of a man named Philemon from that community. He had escaped to Rome, encountered the Apostle Paul, and also encountered the gospel and was gloriously saved. He became such a blessing to Paul there in Rome. But there were some sinful things he'd done in leaving Colossae. And once he got saved, he returned to Colossae to right some wrongs. And we read the rest of his story in the small little book of Philemon. And eventually, if, if Jesus tarries, I hope that we'll find our way there and we can read the rest of the story. But here is this Onesimus, a former slave, and he's such a blessing to the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord, for those friends, those important people that you place in our lives. Good friends in the work of the Lord. Here are a couple of other of those good friends, Aristarchus and Mark. We read about them in verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. Uh, he was a fellow prisoner with Paul, and we, we read about him in other places. He was often with Paul in very difficult times. Some believe that he may have made himself the servant or slave of Paul so that he could travel with him to Rome and be a, a blessing to him. Whatever the case, here is something that is named. He's, he's named here as one who was important to the Apostle Paul. He sends his greetings. And then there's Mark, called Marcus here. He was a relative of Barnabas. Uh, some say a sister's son. That would have been a, a nephew. Uh, the word can also indicate someone who's a cousin, but they were relatives, Barnabas and John Mark. And at one time, I don't know if Paul thought there was a little bit of nepotism involved or not, but at one time Barnabas wanted to take this young man with them. Paul objected, and they parted company. Uh, some harshness was there. Acts 15.36 said, Some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. They were going to check on previous ministry locations. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, you know, his relative. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So at some point, John Mark had left them, and, and Paul felt that he left at an inopportune time, and he didn't think this young man was fit for the work of the Lord to go with them. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So whatever the problem was between John, Mark, and Paul by this time has been patched up. And it's one of those wonderful success stories in a relationship that we don't know all of the answers. Uh, when we get to glory one day, maybe we can hear the full story of how uh, this was remedied and how John Mark's life was uh, perhaps uh, encouraged in the Lord. He grew up a little in the Lord, whatever the case and he became one that was a very, very important part of the ministry. Good friends in the work of the Lord. Thank God. Good friends in the work of the ministry here is one called Jesus Justice. And Jesus was not all that uncommon of a name back then. It, it's the derivative from the Old Testament Joshua. Here's one with that name, and he was apparently a converted Jew. It says, Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. So we don't know very much about this man, except he was a, a fellow worker, a preacher, and he'd been a comfort under the Apostle Paul. You know, sometimes we think of the circumcision as those who gave Paul a lot of trouble, but not all of them. Here is one, a converted Jew who was apparently quite a blessing. A comfort to him, you know, comfort is the work of the Holy Spirit. So here is a, a good man, a blessed man. Good friends in the work of the Lord.
thank God. Here's another one, Pastor Epaphras. Epaphras, who is one of you, in other words, he was from that community. It's believed he was perhaps the pastor of that church. A servant of Christ saluteth you. So at this point, he's apparently there in Rome with Paul. Always laboring fervently for you. How is he laboring fervently? Well, he's laboring fervently in prayers. And we, we talked about that in a previous lesson, how sometimes we can literally travail or labor in prayer. Laboring fervently for you in prayers. What's he praying? Well, that you may stand perfect, spiritually mature, and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. You know, he cared for the church at Colossae. And not just the church at Colossae, but the one in neighboring Laodicea and neighboring Hierapolis. And if you remember from those first lessons, these are part of that tri-city area there. And as I thought about this, I thought, this is my prayer for you, dear listeners. And often in these lessons, there's something that I just feel directed to pray specifically for my listeners. And, and here it is in this chapter. Father, I pray that the listeners here today would, would be perfected, that they would be mature in the things of God, that they would be complete in you, that you would bring them to that place, Father, where they are fully equipped to do whatever it is that you call them to do. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Good friends in the work of the ministry, Luke and Demas. These two men are contrasted here. Luke is the beloved physician, and nothing much is said of Demas here, and we'll see possibly why. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. By Paul's last letter, we find sobering words about Demas. 2 Timothy 4.10 For Demas, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatian. He's, he's talking about a time when he was left with very few around him. Luke, on the other hand, here is a Gentile, a medical doctor, and very much loved. I think there were probably times in the, in the course of Paul's ministry, we're never told this, when it was probably a great benefit to have a medical man with them. Luke is the only Gentile, so far as I can remember, that ever was blessed to write a book or a writing that became a part of Scripture. He wrote Luke and Acts. A good friend, I know a good friend in the work of the ministry. You can read those times in the book of Acts where you know that Luke was actually traveling with Paul. We, we call those the we sections of, of Acts. When Luke uses that pronoun and says we, we, we know that he was with Paul when it was, when it was happening. Good friends in the work of the ministry. He, he speaks of some of the Christians in nearby Laodicea. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, you know, your neighboring churches. And Nymphus and the church which is in his house. Now this Nymphus... It's unclear as to whether this is a masculine or a feminine name. Some have translated it uh, masculine, some feminine. And it doesn't really matter too much because all that is important here is this individual was a person that was a blessing to the Apostle Paul. And there in Laodicea, the church met in their home. They opened up their home uh, for the cause of Christ. And we see both men and women doing this. If you'll remember when we we talked about Lydia, that first convert on the European continent. In an earlier lesson, she opened up her home uh, for the tea preaching party to, to stay there while they were ministering. And perhaps this nymphus is someone like that. Whatever the case, the church met in this person's home. And then he mentions something else that some might find puzzling, but it, I don't find it that much of a, a problem. The Christians in that church at Laodicea were to read this letter, the letter of Colossians, the one that we're reading tonight. 
Then he also mentions that there was a letter written to the Laodiceans. Do you see that? He says, when this epistle is read among you, the Colossians, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. When you're done with it, take it over your neighbors. They can read this too. And that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Uh, so this, these letters were to be passed around. And we're not sure about this letter from Laodicea, what it, what it was. But apparently Paul wrote another letter. I'm sure he wrote many letters, but not everything that he set his pen to was meant to be a part of Holy Scripture. I don't get the idea that this is somehow some kind of hidden thing, some kind of lost Scripture that we're supposed to locate. God has seen fit not only to give us the clear Word of God, but also to preserve it, that which we need. And, uh, you know, all this talk about lost books of the Bible and all that, there's all kinds of writings and uh, some of them are helpful and interesting. Some of them are good historical references. But God has given us, I believe, not only the scriptures, but I believe he's revealed to us the, the proper canon, the, the books that are included. He's given us those things we need for life and godliness. But he's thankful for these good friends in the ministry, this Nymphus and some of these saints there in Laodicea. Good friends in the work of the ministry, here's Archippus in verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Still talking about the church in Laodicea, it's believed he may have been the pastor of that church, neighboring pastor. And he was to take heed to the ministry. He'd received a divine call to ministry. And he was to give careful effort to fulfilling that ministry. It's possible to receive a call to ministry and never fulfill that call. We hear of many over the years that feel like that God called them and yet they resisted the call. But he tells us, Brother Archippus, to fulfill what God has asked him to do. And here in verse 18, we find the closing of this wonderful book of Colossians. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Just a couple of things I want you to note here before we close in prayer. He says this salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Paul most often dictated his letters as was the custom in that day. But in spite of this, he usually added a postscript. In his own handwriting, sometimes this was the mark of authenticity of the letter. And perhaps all of this that mentioned these names, this was something that he wrote in his own hand. But he says, remember my change. In other words, please don't forget me. Keep praying for me. Don't forget me. And then a final word regarding God's grace. God's grace, dear listener, is the only means by which we can receive any of God's blessings. Praise him for his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for leading us and guiding us and directing us through this book of Colossians. Father, there are so many other things that we could have seen, but I pray that those things which we have seen, those things which we have received, those things which we have hidden in our hearts would become such a part of our being, Lord, that we would continue to grow in you, Lord God. That we would be perfected and matured in the things of God. That we would stand strong and true in you. Father, I pray that these words that we've heard tonight and the weeks previous as we've been in this book will continue to speak to our hearts. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.